Hello and welcome to the British Library and the Festival of the Accused. I'm Brett Walsh from the Culture Team and I'm delighted to introduce today's panel on the history of uh, witch trials. Uh, before I hand over to our chair, Naomi, just a few points of housekeeping. So we'd like to welcome our online audiences and also our audiences watching through the Living Knowledge Network, which is a network of libraries around the UK. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be taking questions from um, people in the room, so please do wait for the microphone before you ask your question. And we're also taking uh, online questions from the viewers, so just use the form below the video to submit your question. So our chair today is Naomi Paxton. She is a performer, researcher and broadcaster, and she is Associate Fellow of the School of Advanced Studies at the University of London. She's an Honorary Fellow of the Royal, the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Naomi is also part of the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee for the Magic Circle. She has published widely, including two collections of suffrage plays, uh, in, and in 2018, her monograph Stage Rights, The Actress's Franchise League, Activism and Politics, 1908 to 1958, was published by the University of Manchester Press. Naomi performs in comedy, cabaret, magic, and variety shows as a character, Ada Camp. I hope I said that right. Um, and she has won the Hackney Empire New Act of the Year show, shortlisted most recently for the UK Pantomime Awards, and in 2014, she became BBC Radio 3 a New Generation Thinker. And she's also a regular presenter for Radio 3's Arts and Ideas podcast, Free Thinking. So without further ado, I welcome Naomi and the panel. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much. And um, welcome to Witch Hunt. Um, a history of persecution. Welcome to everybody joining us here in the room and to those joining us online. So the English witch trials raged across this country for three centuries, engulfing the lives of thousands of ordinary people and seeing the execution of 500 victims. Today in the session we're going to be talking about some of the stories and individuals who are part of that grim history with the panel of expert historians here and looking at the legacy of the witch trials and how they have and continue to impact ideas, attitudes and scholarship in the 21st century. We also have a video from Professor Ronald Hutton, specially created for this event, which we'll be playing later. So there's lots to look forward to. And there will be time at the end for questions. So do think them up and ask them. So I'm going to start by introducing the panel. So Malcolm Gaskell is Emeritus Professor of Early Modern History at the University of East Anglia and one of Britain's leading experts in the history of witchcraft. His works include the highly acclaimed Witchfinders, a 17th century English tragedy, and Between Two Worlds, How the English Became Americans. In 2010, Malcolm was a visiting fellow in North American Studies at the Eccles Centre here at the British Library, where he conducted research for his book, Between Two Worlds. And in November 2021, Alan Lane published his most recent book, The Ruin of All Witches. Thank you for joining us. Um, Marion Gibson is Professor of Renaissance and Magical Literature at the University of Exeter. She's the author of seven books on witches in history and literature, including Reading Witchcraft, Possession, Puritanism and Print, Rediscovering Renaissance Witchcraft, and with Joe Ezra, Shakespeare's Demonology. Her latest book, Witchcraft, A History in 13 Trials, visual case, um, was published by Simon & Schuster in June 2023. So thank you both for joining us today. <laughs> so, Mariam, in your new book, you have a very useful summary of the characteristics of the accused. I'm going to read this out here. Um, so you say that, let's see... Uh, people can be most plausibly accused of witchcraft if they are female or slash and also accused of sexual misconduct as defined by their time and place, poor, either averagely or absolutely, an indigenous person perceived to be in conflict with a colonial regime, disabled, vulnerable or unwell, claiming unsanctioned knowledge or power, especially religious or medical, and perceived to be politically subversive. Uh, Tell us about how those things have manifested over the course of particularly the three centuries of the English witch trials, but into the 21st century today. Thank you. That's it is a useful summary, isn't it? Though I say it myself. And I think it brings together some of the themes that we've seen today already. Um, I think that's one of the ways people see the witch as a subversive figure, as, as a figure who undercuts the kind of structures of society that actually today we find problematic patriarchy, 
certain kinds of organised religion and so on. And certainly that's the way that the witch was seen in the period of the witch trials. So somebody who was probably heretical in terms of religion, who was probably politically subversive in some way, so may have been seen to be acting against magistrates or kings um, or other figures in their society who were supposed to have authority but perhaps felt anxious about how much they actually had. People who were perhaps sexually subversive in some way, so maybe they had an illegitimate child, which by the standards of their time was regarded as a terrible and sinful thing. Um, or maybe they were people who had lived in ways which were not approved of by their society, had multiple partners, for example. So there's a whole range of different ways that people might come to the attention of the authorities. Some of them may have practiced magic, and we've heard today that, you know, magic, it was a magical world, wasn't it? It was a world full of spirits and goblins and, and animal familiars and heaven knows what. And therefore, some of those people may have thought of themselves as magicians. But many of them would have been people who didn't think of themselves in that way at all and were, if you like, just like us. And that's one of the things that really prompted me to, to write the book. It was that sense that this could have happened to us and it could still happen to us in a variety of ways. People are still being witch hunted. And we can talk about what we mean by that term if you want to. But certainly in the past, those were the kind of characteristics that might have defined a witch. Thank you. Um, Malcolm, in your, in your book, uh, Witchcraft, you have a, several very evocative woodcuts mm. and illustrations um, that kind of created and perpetuated a stereotype of witches from that period that we're most familiar with today. So mm. I'm thinking an older woman, she's mm. bent over, she's dressed very poorly, she's surrounded by her familiars. Can you mm. talk about those for us? Yeah, so the, the, the stereotype of the witch in the early modern period is something that 17th century people have in their own minds. They, rec they would recognise the modern stereotype of the old woman bent, you know, perhaps f physically disfigured in some way, leaning on a crutch with the animals around. That was a sort of a fixed stereotype. They don't always, and it's an interesting thing because we can come on to talk about it, they don't actually abide by that stereotype when they come to make accusations. Not always. Mm. And that witchcraft is a much more deeper felt thing, but there's the two, those two things are going on at the same time. So, so yes, yeah, as Mariam was saying, that, that witches are fundamentally powerless people who other people imagine have power, probably unfairly, or in some cases that they claim power to themselves. So witchcraft is power for the powerless. That's what the, the standard image is. And so the, the question, and they, it's never really resolved in the period, and this is one of the reasons why evidence and proof is so difficult at trials, is actually quite how if witches do have this power, how they actually get it. So that there is a tension between theological, demonological ideas from above, what they call a learned tradition of witchcraft, and the folk knowledge of witchcraft. And they sort of meet in the area of the demon and sort of in the area of the demonic imp, which you're asking about. So the theologians and um, ministers and magistrates don't have much truck with the, the animal familiar because actually what the way in which Protestant um, ideologues, ministers, preachers, what, what they want to communicate through witchcraft is really that this is about worshipping the devil in your heart. It's not some gross material thing where actually you meet a demon. But you know, these are very abstract ideas that are easy for kind of Oxbridge educated ministers to understand. But for most of the unlettered congregation, that they will understand the communication to the unseen, invisible world <clears throat> in a much more literal, graphic, visceral sort of way. And so that even though the, the learned tradition doesn't like the idea of the animal familiar, it's an important part of the folk tradition, especially in England, um, because this is the way that the, the, it's a way of kind of visually um, reifying what the, the, the idea of the witch forming the pact with the devil in our heart onto something which is physical. I mean, anyone's read kind of the Philip Pullman, the, um, uh, you know, the Dark Materials tree, the idea of the demon there is the, of course, is the, is, is the sort of the fantasy of the externalized soul who becomes a soulmate and becomes a, uh, an, and takes an animal form that is shape-shifting until you settle and grow up. And of course, there is something in that. So it makes complete sense, but the, it, it does also expose the tension between the, the idea of witchcraft from above and the idea of witchcraft from below, to put it crudely, and that there has to be a negotiation between those two things in the courtroom for somebody actually to be convicted. 
Are the, so a lot of these um, initial kind of English witch trials and hunts take place in quite rural areas of, mm -hmm. of England. Mm -hmm. Are the animal familiars or the imps mm -hmm. that are described, um, are they very familiar to the English countryside? Are there any fantastical <sighs> animals around? Well, well, I mean, rarely not. I mean, they tend to be your sort of, you know, your cats and mice and your squirrels. So ferrets and, and frogs and, and, and dogs. You know, the odd bear, small bear, or the odd rabbit, occasionally a snail or two. Uh, feature, <laughs> but you know that they are they are, they are things that are <clears throat> one of the things about testimony about witchcraft, especially the testimony that's used in a legal context, is it must be pl plausible. It's got to feel right. You've got to feel that the devil's there, otherwise people don't convict. So that the more kind of homespun, mundane, un to us sometimes rather seems rather silly, is the sort of thing that actually in the legal context could be more compelling because there will be demonologists who think, well, this has the ring of truth. You wouldn't make that up, a snail, <laughs> you know? And that actually, although it for us, it, it, it tips over into absolute ludicrous implausibility, in that kind of context, it could make sense as something which is, well, do you know, that doesn't sound like something that, you know, somebody, some witness parroting something that a witch finder has said. Mm. That sounds like something that comes from the, the context of the community, the household, the neighborhood, the, the real fine-grained, context of people's lives. Um, and Marin, in terms of identifying um, how witches are influenced by or influence their familiars or their imps, I'm quite fascinated by <laughs> imps. I'm going to just, I'm going to get that up front. Um, <laughs> um, how, what evidence are mm. the, the watchers, for example, or the witch hunters looking for mm. that uh, the accused have been communing with mm. familiars or communicating with familiars? They're looking for bodily evidence, really. So this is about bodies, which is another big theme that has come up today. And they're looking for places where, say, the animal familiar, the imp, the, the snail, the cat might have sucked blood out of the person's body who was being accused of being a witch because they were thought to take blood in, in reward for their services. So, you know, you would instruct your little dog to go off to your neighbour and, and attack them to bring down Satan's power on them and, you know, cause illness in their household or hurt them in some way or hurt their animals or their crops or whatever. And as a reward, you would give them a drop of blood. And that was partly, presumably, as nourishment, some of the people who were asked about what they thought they were doing with this said, oh, well, I guess it's nourishment then. But also, of course, blood is really, really symbolically powerful, isn't it? So, you know, it, it's the stuff of life. It's also seen to have this kind of religious significance. You know, Christ's blood is, is what is really important in the Christian story. That's what saves humanity. So it's, it's, it's this sort of symbolic representation of this bodily interchange with the familiar, which has got something to do with suckling babies and something sexual about it and something nourishing about it and something religious about it. And again, it does sound utterly ludicrous, doesn't it? You know, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be suckling a little frog or something like that, much less a bear mm. or one of the more unusual familiars. But the idea is that this makes sense symbolically, and it's a very religious world. People live in a world which is very rich in symbolism. And so, again, that idea of plausibility comes in. You know, if this is in the Christian story that we're told in church, well, perhaps also this village man or woman here has been doing these same sort of things. So it was meaningful to them to look for certain kinds of evidence, and often it was, it was a bodily mark of some kind. So witches were marked by the devil, they were marked by their familiar, and, of course, that was how you could discover who they were. In, in terms of yourself as a scholar looking at some of this evidence, what do you think those marks were? Mm. There's quite a bit of evidence of what they are, actually, because helpfully, people like you, people at the time were utterly fascinated by this. Um, they really wanted to know more. And some of that is to do with the sense that, isn't this a bit odd? And I think some of it is kind of prurient, and some of it is to do with boundaries between the animal and human and you know sort of scientific curiosity about how this relationship works so they would look for things like warts and they describe something and you think that's a wart or they would describe something and then somebody would say these are just like flea bites and you would think yes that's because they're flea bites yeah. <laughs> so often they would have a very mundane appearance <coughs> Malcolm geographically can you set up a little bit for us about this the, the spread of English witch hunts from the kind of 15th century to the 17th century. So Suffolk comes up a lot, and we'll hear about more about that later. Mm. Um, wh what are the hot spots, and where are the cold spots? 
Well, <clears throat> the hotspots, I mean, they vary over time, but we, we, we're mostly talking about East Anglia in the middle of the 17th century. That accounts for uh, about a fifth of all known executions in the whole of the country and the whole of the early modern period. And this is, of course, you find this in other countries too. It's not, you know, the, 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 there's sometimes um, a sort of a myth or an assumption that people are constantly accusing people of witchcraft and having witch trials all the time, as if there are witch trials in every place. The, the really bad witch hunts tend to spike at some particular moment and then they subside for, for complicated reasons, um, often the reverse of the reasons why they rose in the first place. So you, so that what happens in East Anglia, I know we're going to, to Ron um, Hutton's clip is going to be talking about this, so I'm not going to say anything about it, really about it now, but that this really sort of dominates in rather like Salem, it doesn't, mm. it's, the, it's the most visible, the most memorable, the most vivid and emotional representation of colonial witchcraft. It's completely the exception that proves the rule, and the rule is that actually the witch trials are not actually very common, or which certainly witch hunts are not very common. So the, in England, you before the, you know before and after, you tend to have a scatter, but the, you and it, and it is of course affected by the surviving records. So mm -hmm. you do, for example, get quite a spike of trials in Essex in the 1580s and 1590s, and same way you get a spike in Essex in the 1640s. But a lot of that's to do with the fact that we know a lot about the, the assize records for that time. We've got good runs of indictments for the home counties of Essex and, um, uh, Essex and Kent and Sussex and Hertfordshire. So, uh, you know, so we have to be a little bit careful, but you know, we, we know a lot more now about which trials that are happening in borough record, in you know, borough or, um, jurisdictions and some ecclesiastical jurisdictions. And when you, you, but really, you don't get huge, con apart from what happens in East Anglia in the 16th, you don't get huge concentrations. Of course, north of the border over in Scotland you do. You have these mm. often politically inspired panics. But, you know, it's, again, the panics aren't necessarily representative of what you have um, uh, generally. So you get, so most places, most places in England, England's made up of 9,000 parishes in the 17th century. Most places produce no convicted witches at all. Um, not to say that there were witch beliefs or suspicions or accusations informally, not saying that. But in actual witch trials, they don't. Mm. Um, so it's a rather an unusual, it's rather a difficult thing in its own time to create. Um, but you get scatters of them here and there because there is a witchcraft act and people can use it. Yes, can you just uh, tell us about the witchcraft act? Just bookend those for us. I think, is it 15? It's Henry VIII, isn't it? The first one. So Henry VIII brings century. in the, the, the first 60, the first, what we think of as the first modern, <laughs> that's not quite the right word, uh, modern <laughs> witchcraft statute. That's then repealed in the reign of, of Edward VI, his son. And then there's a sort of a gap over the reign of Queen Mary, and then Elizabeth I brings in uh, Witchcraft Act in 1563. This gets tinkered with and a bit souped up um, by James I in 1604, and then this goes on right until it's finally repealed in 1950, sorry, 1735, and then they, that's replaced with an act called the Witchcraft Act, uh, not very original, that goes on to 1951, but that's a different kind of story. So it's essentially, when we're talking about witch hunting in England, we're essentially talking about, in the reign of Elizabeth I, the 1563 Act, and then the 1604 Act under James I, which puts a greater emphasis on the demonic pact. Mm. And this is something which colonists take to America. Mm. Yes. Uh, when, Marion, does the sort of feminist and pagan reclaiming of the idea of the witch begin? It starts a bit earlier than you think, actually. Um, so it starts in the 19th century. You could possibly even push it a little bit further back than that if you wanted to. But one of the key figures there is Jules Michelet, the French historian. Um, and he's, he presents himself as very much a sort of classic historian, you know, somebody who studies old records and writes down facts. But he also has this fantastic new age strand to his thinking. So he's a pantheist. He, he believes that the whole world is animated and that the world is full of spirits. And there's a great pantheon of, of wider gods than the Christian, which is really interesting for his time. You know, this is the 18, sort of 1830s to 60s, say. And as part of that, he starts thinking, well, what about those people who were accused of witchcraft in the past? You know, I've read the records of them as an historian, but what do I make of them as, as a spiritual man, as a religious believer? So he starts thinking, well, actually, maybe they were pagan priestesses. 
Now, that's a really early moment for somebody to be having that thought. You know, probably people might think, well, that happens in the 1960s, say. But it doesn't. It happens before. And the, the people in the 1960s, the radical feminists and the pagans who started to rediscover these ideas, often look back to Michelet as the person who started to, to, to popularise them, really. He wrote a book called The Witch, um, and you, you can read it today. It's, it's here in translation. It was translated again um, and popularised in the 1960s and 70s. So Michelet is a really interesting, important figure. Um, and the idea of, of the reclamation of the witch goes right back to the mid-Victorian period. That's fascinating. I was going to ask you about spiritualism, mm. um, which I know you've written about as well. And so a different way of kind of predominantly women mm. engaging with esoteric practices that have often kind of trod that line between witchcraft mm. and spirituality? Well, <clears throat> spiritualism starts in the middle of the 19th century in upstate New York, uh, but quite quickly transfers over the Atlantic to especially kind of northern industrial cities where there were strong traditions of low church, nonconformity, Methodism, which were acts of departure away from the traditional hierarchy of these very top-down patriarchal churches. So it was rather religion for the people. Mm. And it said, you know, you don't have to... This was the message of spiritualism. You don't have to depend upon um, uh, faith anymore. We can prove it. You know, we can hear the messages. It's a material thing. It's a very... It's actually, ironically, rather a secularised form of religion because it doesn't need to rely on faith. But, of course, this antagonises people, orthodox religionists, Christians, uh, and it does right through into the 20th century because... And actually, the Catholic Church are particularly um, uh, vociferous about this, particularly opposed to spiritualism, because they say, well, these voices that you hear these aren't your ancestors. This is the de This is the way that the devil will get to you. So, of course, this isn't. But this, the, the condemnation isn't just religious; it's legal as well, because spiritualist, me spiritualist mediums find themselves at the attentions of the law. And so, and this is really why the Witchcraft Act of 1735 in this country, and the similar legislation in the states, and also um, the 1824 Vagrancy Act, are used against spiritualist mediums who. Are, are accused of not helping, like we might think of the traditional cunning woman, helping people in the community, but actually exploiting them, uh, particularly for uh, monetary gain. And that, again, is, is, a, is, a, is a sort of a tension between class and gender and religion and belief and, uh, and the law. And that's, in a sense, so what really is happening, if you strip what's happening to spiritualism down to its basics, it does really have those echoes back to the prosecution of witchcraft in the 16th, 17th centuries. There's a, there's a feeling about spiritualism that, particularly in wartime, after the First War and during the Second War, that it's very much preying on the vulnerable. Mm. Um, whereas it feels like, and a lot of the writing you've done about um, witchcraft earlier on, in the, particularly in the 17th century, that it's about preying on the powerful. Mm. Would it be fair to say that? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's a lovely historical <laughs> turnaround, isn't it? Yes. Get it. <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. Yes, so, the, so you know, all those ideas of subversion that I was talking about earlier, they do carry right on, and it's powerful people who continue to persecute the spiritualists and the pagans and so on. But, yes, they are doing it on, in the belief that what those people are doing is essentially a contract. So they're being prosecuted not because the powerful people think that they are really witches, but actually because they think, well, they, you know, they're defrauding these good people of their money for coming to seances or doing spells or whatever. Fascinating. Any thoughts about that, Malcolm? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the Metropolitan Police have a very, very clear line on it in the first half of the 20th century, which is it is just fraud. Mm -hmm. And they will protect the people uh, against being defrauded at all costs. They will consider nothing else. Of course, in wartime, it has a particular kind of piquancy because it's considered to be lowering public morale if spiritualist mediums give messages about men who are either become prisoners of war or sometimes mediums talk about um, air raids to come because of course in wartime because of censorship and everything being sort of shut down and quiet that there's this greater anxiety and a greater need to know and spiritualists do actually fill that gap and they of course feel that they are they are performing this public service in the same way the cunning folk must have once felt they're performing a, a public service but the the idea that they are lowering morale and that's another thing that during wartime that the um the, the police take a very, very dim view of at all. So it's just, 
it, it's just about perspective, really. And I suppose a lot of the history of witchcraft is about perspective. You have different players. You have high and low and men and women and so on. And they are seeing the same thing from different perspectives. But then it becomes a question of power, not just of perspective, because those, perspe uh, those perspectives are not equally valid. Um, the more powerful one will win out, and that's why people go to prison or people in the 17th century go to the gallows. Yeah, did you want to come in on that one? Uh, no, not really, but I do think that it's important to think about the punishments. I mean, we've, we've, thought, about, we've thought about how there's a long history of cunning magic and the sense that people have magical powers and want to celebrate those magical powers, or we want to celebrate the idea of the witch as a transgressor and, you know, kind of avatar for all of the other kind of transgressions that we might very well now um, value today. But, of course, terrible things happened to them. So, yes, they, they were on the whole hanged. One or two of them were burned for crimes like murdering their own husbands, which was regarded as a petty treason because it was a about being subversive against the head of the household. Um, and the, yeah, the, these people were put to death in very large numbers. You know, we're talking tens of thousands of people across all of the jurisdictions that historians have studied. Um, and it's worth remembering that. It's worth remembering and memorialising that because it is this terrible history of persecuting people who are seen as different, who are scapegoated, who are, you know, our leaders, as, as they thought of themselves as being, encouraged us to hate and root out from our communities. And, you know, I think that's a legacy that we can still see today. Absolutely. I think, I mean, you've both written extensively about not only English witch trials, but also European and American uh, instances. But I, I know this is the Festival of the Accused, but we sort of can't help but look at the accusers. And I think this would be a good time um, to have our, our VT um, from uh, Ronald, who will be telling us about one of the best known uh, witch finders of the English witch trials. Hello, everybody. I'm Ronald Hutton. I am Professor of History at Bristol University and Gresham Professor of Divinity at London. I've published 18 books and 94 essays on different aspects of history, many of them concerning the history of witchcraft and magic. And that's why I'm delighted to be involved with the Festival of the Accused in London at the British Library and to be able to open up for you some of the very rich collection of manuscripts at the library, which the public can consult with a reader's ticket that refer to the history of witchcraft. The first of the manuscripts in front of me that need discussion, because it's the first in order of appearance, refers to one of the most notorious episodes in the whole sad history of the English witch hunts, so famous that it actually inspired a classic folk horror movie starring Vincent Price, entitled Witchfinder General. It refers to a particular episode which was a vicious witch hunt in East Anglia that started in 1645 and was mostly contained in that summer. The manuscript itself consists of the depositions, the confessions and the witness statements for a set of women and a few men accused of witchcraft in the county of Suffolk. The fact that these trials could happen at all was entirely due to a complete collapse in the English legal system. On the whole, across Europe, states that had large territories, stable centralised governments and centralised and professional legal systems tended to put relatively few people to death for witchcraft. The places that produced the really atrocious body counts were either tiny states with the emotions that inspired the accusations engulfing the people who actually conducted the trials or places where justice was decentralised. In other words, where the central government imparted the power to try accused witches to the very people who'd accused them. 
England had neither of those. It had a system of justice which was still going on when I was young called the Assizes, whereby professional judges from the centre rode out, literally, on circuits from one county town to another to hear local cases. The verdicts would be pronounced by juries of people drawn from all over the county and most unlikely to know the accused and instructed by detached professional judges. Because of this, the average acquittal rate for people accused of witchcraft in England ran at about 75 to 80 percent. In other words, you did need to be demented, senile, or terrified out of your wits and so likely to confess, or else have an entire village lined up against you to be found guilty. But all of that came to a temporary halt in the mid-1640s, because the English Civil War was raging. Armies were rampaging up and down the land, territory was savagely contested, and the Assize judges couldn't ride out, and the courts couldn't take place. So there was a suspension of justice. And into that vacuum, in the safe parliamentarian Puritan heartland of East Anglia, stepped a nobody, a junior member of a minor gentry family from the Essex coast called Matthew Hopkins. He was a young man dying of tuberculosis, coughing out his lifeblood into handkerchiefs. What he wanted to do before he died was to take on the devil and defeat him in some respect. And the way in which he chose to do it was by fighting witchcraft. His consciousness had been raised by reading some witch hunting manuals from the European continent. And now he wanted to purge the land of witches. He assembled a team of vigilantes, and with nobody to oppose him because the general legal system was gone, he proceeded to make a circuit of East Anglia, inviting the local people to bring out their suspects. Hopkins and his team then tortured the accused into confessing by depriving them of sleep, by brutalising them with threats and constant harassment, and by tying them to furniture and, aside from it, with knots and in bonds that made their muscles scream with pain. A lot of his victims were elderly, a lot were in poor health. They were all confused and terrified. And so his torture methods generally brought about breakdowns and confessions. And after the people had confessed, they were tried by hastily assembled kangaroo courts of local bigwigs who believed the confessions and sentenced the accused to death. And probably about a hundred people died in the course of Matthew Hopkins' witch hunt. That's possibly as many as a quarter of the entire number of people ever executed for witchcraft or the alleged crime of witchcraft in England. It couldn't last for two reasons. The first was that Hopkins' methods, having taken everybody by surprise, generated increasing criticism and opposition. And this was eventually enough to have him stopped. But also the Civil War ended and the normal system of justice was restored, leaving no room for somebody like Hopkins. He managed to survive a year after the end of the war and then succumbed to his disintegrating lungs. And mercifully, there's been nothing like him in English history since. Our next set of documents in this manuscript here relate to one of the great witch trials of English history, great in the sense of the fame and controversy that it generated, but also great in the sense that it was the last notable witch trial in English history, that of an elderly Hertfordshire woman called Jane Wenham. Initially, 
her trial was absolutely standard and followed the course that had produced so many actions against suspected witches before. And in the case of a small minority of those accused, their deaths on the end of a hangman's rope. Jane Wenham was a woman deeply unpopular with some of her neighbours in her little Hertfordshire town. And increasingly, some came to blame their personal misfortunes upon her and eventually to accuse her of witchcraft. And she was duly indicted after a local magistrate had written his opinion that there was a case to be answered and was put on trial at the Assizes. But here's the difference from before, that although the local public opinion was against her, and so was the majority of the jury, the judge was not. And the judge was one of those who'd come to believe that witch trials were unreliable ways of fighting witchcraft. All over Europe, the same pattern had been established since the middle of the 17th century. It began with lawyers and clergy raising doubts about the evidence. Nobody was yet questioning the existence of witchcraft. Nobody was questioning the existence of the devil. But what people were starting to question was how you actually proved that somebody had made a pact with the devil and had bewitched people unless they actually admitted to it. And if they did admit to it, how were you, how were you sure they were sane? How were you sure that they were responsible for their words and their actions? It was clear in a lot of cases that those who were freely confessing were not. And so more and more educated people began to doubt the evidence. And once the evidence came to be doubted, and this was increasingly in the 1660s and 1670s, it became harder and harder to get convictions of people put on trial. And as more and more people became acquitted, people became increasingly reluctant to accuse anybody. A trial's a laborious, expensive, reputationally risky business. Most people suspected of witchcraft, even in the worst points of fear and hatred of it, were not actually accused and brought to trial. And so the odds seemed to be more and more stacked against what was always a difficult and embarrassing and a dodgy process. And the final stage in the early 18th century was if people ceased to be convicted altogether, there was no point in accusing them. And the next stage after that was to repeal the laws against witchcraft because they didn't seem to be doing anything anymore. In Jane Wenham's case, there was an enormous controversy generated by the trial with different authors lining up for and against her. And in the end, she was formally pardoned and so acquitted. And she went back to what one assumes would be a very uneasy life among her neighbors. At that point, she already elderly, fades out of history. After Jane Wenham's trial, there were no more high-profile witch trials in England. Accusations continued for a while, but they were no longer producing celebrated legal cases. So poor old Jane stood at the end of quite a long process, and at the beginning of that, which was, at least so far, to relieve the English of the threat of prosecution for witchcraft for good. Mm. Um, so, Malcolm, you've written extensively about Matthew Hopkins, and I think in your talk about your latest book, I heard you say, uh, quote, the wickedness that accusers saw in others was always still there in themselves. Mm. Um, why was Matthew Hopkins so obsessed with witches? He's the son of a, a Puritan minister, and the, this is, as Ron was saying, is the period of the English Civil War, where a man like Hopkins, 
feels this mission to step forward. He feels he's fighting. I mean, we're very familiar with the kind of set-piece battles of the English Civil War, but Puritans like Hopkins felt they were fighting a spiritual war, um, and that was part of it. And so he saw himself deluded, for sure, but he saw himself as a, you know, as a sort of a spiritual warrior. You know, he's found that he, he would ride out, and he was doing God's bidding. Of course, it's difficult to know exactly what his motivation was, but it's, you know, some people have said it was because he was just doing it for money. In fact, people at the time said he was just doing it for money. And of course, those that turned against the witch hunt quite soon afterwards felt that this was actually what Hopkins was doing was a, a worse symbol of disorder in English life than the existence of witches. And after the Civil War, there was a sort of to return to order and, and, and turn their backs on this. But it's very important to remember about Hopkins that he, he undoubtedly everything that Ronald said is, is absolutely right. But what, what Hopkins is doing, and this is what Vince, not what Vincent Price does in the, uh, in the classic movie, but he goes on and just sort of points the finger at people. Hopkins is drawing on the stories, the testimonies, the feelings, often built up, pent up anxieties, fear, and genuine sincere fear and anger that's accumulated in East Anglian communities in the 1630s, which have been very low periods of witchcraft trials. So a whole generation of anxiety in communities that then is dispensed. So what Hopkins is doing more than anything else with his own kind of weird twisted charisma is that he is encouraging people who might be reticent to go to law to come forward with their stories. He's saying, trust me, the, you know, he, I'm a man of experience. This is one of his favourite words, or certain <laughs> favourite ideas to get across. I know these things, and if you come forward, we'll help. And of course, Hopkins himself turns up to the, in the courts as a witness too, just to keep things moving along. So that it's, it's, it isn't just about you know, weird Hopkins going and, and accusing people on his own. It's about actually drawing upon genuine fears and anxieties between neighbours that have been rather kind of pent up before. And just very, very quickly on the back of that, just because something else that Ron mentioned, is that, is that the, the, the trajectory of scepticism towards the 1670s and 1660s, as Ron was saying, is, is right, because, of course, in the end, witchcraft trials do peter away and then the act's repealed. But the witchcraft is always in doubt. There is always doubt about why... Um, you know, what witchcraft is and whether it can be pinned on an individual. So that the, that sort of scepticism about proof is something you see in the 16th century and in the first half of the 17th century. And that ultimately, as Ronald alluded to, is that is why in, in, in English witchcraft trials the acquittal rate is about 75%. Um, it changes in during witch hunts, but generally it's 70, which is really surprising, I think, to people, but it's really because in the end, although everyone believes in witchcraft, when it really comes to trying somebody for their life, jurors and courts are not quite so sure whether there is this substantive evidence on which you can convict and hang someone. Um, Marion, I wanted to ask you about the written evidence from those trials, because obviously... Mm. Documentation about women's lives, and particularly poor women or working class women's lives, is quite scarce in this period. They're not publishing books necessarily. Um, what are you able to glean from mm. accounts of the trials that really give you a glimpse into the lives of, of women and, and men in this period? Yeah, actually a surprising amount. I mean, it's great to see Ronald turning over those wonderful documents, isn't it? Um, that one from Suffolk, for example, if you look at that, we don't know m much about most of those people. But I think we can find out more. And one of the places you can find out more is parish records. You can also look at things like deeds. So were they involved in any land transactions? You can look at manorial records. So you can see whether they were a tenant of a particular manor. Um, did they fall out with their neighbours over stuff like, you know, not clearing out their, their ditches or not cutting their hedges or cutting down somebody's tree? or something like that. You can see all that kind of thing. And I've come to think that we can know a bit more about them, and that's at least partly because the technology has changed. You know, not only can Ronald and other people look at those documents in person, but they can be digitised and they can be shared and they can be put online. And that's been done for a lot of parish registers. It's been done for a lot of documents that kind of headline documents like witch trial ones. So, there's a, for example, there's a big site devoted to the Salem witchcraft trials where you can read every single record. It doesn't matter where it is. It could be in Boston. It could be in Salem itself. It could be somewhere else. You can actually see that for yourselves. And I think that sort of democratisation of history 
is really important in getting more information about people in the past whose lives were not particularly well documented, but were sometimes documented to some extent. And that goes for women particularly, of course, you know, the idea of this, this hidden history of both the people who were accused of witchcraft and their accusers, who were often women too, but also the poorer men who tended to be accused of witchcraft as well. So I think there's so much more to learn. And it's wonderful, really, that we have all these means to access these records, which we haven't had before. Um, let's talk briefly about the spread of the ideas of witchcraft, not only the demonologies and the book publications that are happening, but the spread of people uh, going particularly perhaps to the Americas before the Salem Witch Trials. Can you just talk a little bit, frame a little bit about that for us before we open up to questions? Yeah, so the, the, um, uh, the Witchfinder story, um, the East Anglian Witch Hunt, really, uh, and I suppose the context over that, the English Civil War, that, you know, there is this intense spiritual crisis and political crisis and religious crisis and everything crisis that's going on in England in the middle of the 17th century. And that some people decide to stay. Cromwell starts to stay and fight a civil war. But Cromwell nearly goes to America, you know. He really weighs it up. And, of course, there's a man called John Winthrop who leads migrations in the 1630s. And he's a man, the social profile is so like Cromwell. But he's someone on the balance of probability or balance of his own conscience feels that he should go. And so, that you, you know, you, you're seeing 350,000 people in the 17th century leave the British Isles, go to the North American colonies, and many of those people, certainly in New England, are what we would call Puritans. I mean, it's a rather a mixed bag. Americans call them all Puritans. We would be a little bit more differentiating, I think, about who was actually a member of the godly from England. But, of course, that they, they're going to first of all, get away from what they consider to be the sort of demonic backsliding of England, but they're also going in this rather nostalgic way to recreate a sense of English charity in America, to recreate a New England, um, because they feel that England is, is, has lost that. They want to set this new ideal for old England that seems to have lost its way. Of course, long story short, what actually they find with all this idealism is that they take the devil with them, they take themselves <laughs> with them, and that quite quickly they start falling out with each other and they have some many old world problems like poverty and witchcraft and generally not being very nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> you've, uh, Marion, you've written that uh, it is often indigenous communities or mm. non-Christian communities who are demonised, literally, mm. by the kind of Christian colonisers. Mm. Um, and that's in Europe and in America, is that right? It is. It's so disappointing, isn't it? <laughs> Particularly in the American context. You know, these people have gone halfway across the world in order to found new communities which they believe will be based on truth and justice and godliness and all this kind of stuff which they think is, is an ideal. And what do they do? The first thing they do is turn on each other. So the first American witchcraft trial is in the 1620s. They have barely been there any time at all. Isn't that amazing? And of course, they also turn on the indigenous people, which is just particularly despicable, isn't it? So people who are drawn into the witch hunts are often people who are Native Americans and who are seen to be part of this, this is a great phrase, demonic backsliding. Um, because, you know, their paganism, their indigenous religion, their spirituality is misrecognised as being worshipping the devil. And it's just, it's just such a tragic history of people. I think Matthew Hopkins was the same in some ways. People trying to do something good but failing so utterly miserably and ending up inflicting terror and harm and misery and death on their neighbours when actually what they meant to do was cleanse and purify the world and make everything better. It, it is a horrible history, isn't it, of, of, of mistake. <laughs> It is. Um, and uh, now we come to some questions. Are there any questions in the audience or perhaps online for either of our expert <coughs> panel? Um, please, yes, do put your hand up and then we'll wait, wait for a, um, a microphone to come to you. There we go. Thank you. Um, hey, uh, thank you for this. It's been really interesting. Uh, I'm just wondering, you, you've sort of touched on um, there some of the, the myths around the witch hunts and the fact that, you know, we hear about people turning on each other, turning on their neighbours, or the sort of social contagion sort of side of it. I'm just wondering if you could, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about the records and how much of that is actually reflected in the records. Is that just uh, an assumption we're making, or is it actually what happened out there? Um, okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, 
so the records. Well, you know, historians aren't scientists. They, you know, we, we work in the humanities. We have to interpret. And uh, the, the way that we interpret is, of course, we bring something of ourselves and our interests to when we look at a document. But then, of course, we also read a lot. And we read a lot, you know, Merriam's listing different kinds of primary sources. And, of course, these things all bounce off each other. And so to build up a picture about what, what the meaning of these words, say, in a, in a, in a deposition from a court case about witchcraft really is. Because these are often quite strange documents. It is actually quite hard to see what is going on. And the best we can really do is to kind of fill in the context, the, the emotional context, the cultural context, the religious context, to try to see what actually somebody might have meant in the time. But in the end... It, it is, it's a question of interpretation, and we, are, we, we might not be dealing with the, the, the supernatural in our history, but we are dealing with people who believe in the supernatural. And it's very important, and certainly in, in, in Marion's work, it's something that I tried to do too, where you, you don't have to um, sort of share somebody's supernatural beliefs, even like Hopkins, um, but you do have to believe that they believed it. You do have to take their categories and their terms seriously and be slightly careful about exporting some of our own assumptions and our own terminology um, back into the past. I think that's the best hope of understanding them, but also actually to respecting the people that we're trying to write something about. Yeah, I also think, I mean, days like today, I find really inspiring because I think writing history, as you say, is a creative endeavour. So it's part of a continuum of creative, artistic, literary activity. You know, we're all doing the same things, actually. We're looking at documents and trying to interpret them. But at the end of the day, we want to tell a story. And so you have to do a little bit of filling in. You have to try and put yourself in the emotional position um, that people in the past would have been in. But also you're thinking, well, you know, thinking creatively, what if this had happened to me? What would I have done? Um, or what would that person have thought on that day? Or you know, what did they have for breakfast that day? What did they see when they went out of the door? And as soon as you start to tell a story like that, you have to imagine all the rest of their world as well. So I think days like this, I find them really inspiring. And I, and I find the idea... Um, I don't personally believe in magic myself. A shocking revelation, I'm sorry. I'm really, really boring. But I, I love the idea of meeting people who do and getting the sense that you, you, know, you would probably have understood the magical world rather better than somebody like me who goes to it and thinks, oh, well, you know, this is probably all about economics or it's probably, <laughs> it's probably all about land, isn't it? Um, because that sense of imaginatively putting ourselves in the... In the the shoes of our ancestors, I think, really important. So, yeah, we, we are all working together on the same thing, it seems to me. Thank you. Uh, one down here and then one up there, I think. Oh, a few up there, lovely. Do you want to come down to the... Lovely, thank you. Hi. Um, I read um, uh, Witchfinders... I thought it was an amazing book and really inspiring. And um, <clears throat> But I wondered whether... Uh, one, one of the things that I didn't really understand was that lots of the um, depositions by the women who were, you know, uh, accused of being witches was similar, so similar, you know, lots of similar stories. And I thought, why... Um, did they all... Is witchcraft, was witchcraft actually a real thing that they all knew what it was? Or yeah. <laughs> were, they, were, they taught, were, they, were they taught by, the, by their accusers to, what to say? Or what, what, was that going, what was going on there? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I'll, I'll keep it brief because I know there are a lot of the questions uh, out there. But <clears throat> in short, that, that the witchcraft depositions and witchcraft convictions, the stories that are told in court, are a composite. You know, they are a hybrid of different traditions and ideas trying to actually find some commonality between them. So everybody does have a sense of what a witch is. They might, you might never actually meet one or encounter one, but everybody knows the stories of witchcraft and they know what it means. You know, the, the, there are folk tales going back to the uh, Middle <coughs> Ages of people, you know, a woman walking in the woods and then she's complaining about the fact that she's got a lot of work and then a man comes out to her and says, oh, hello, I could help you with your work. You don't need to work like this. And, of course, it's the devil and they form a pact. It, it's a trope of folk, folk tales and fairy tales and it's you know, familiar to children even. 
That's a kind of Grimm's fairy tale idea. So I think that everybody does have that kind of idea. Of course, when you actually get to, to try to dissect the, uh, the substance of a, a deposition or a confession, you've got that in there. You've also got the expectations of the demonologist or in Hopkins or the interrogator who is trying to shape whatever is being said to create the kind of evidence that will get a conviction. And that's another reason for searching the bodies uh, to look for the mark that Mariam was talking about earlier. Of course, there is just one other thing you might look into that is that there are con free confessions. Now, that is a contentious thing. It's not necessarily, there are confessions where women uh, um, say they are witches, where there is not any, at least any obvious form of torture or coercion. And that, of course, leaves the, the, the possibility open of witchcraft being a fantasy a fantasy of power to extremely poor, the, the, very, the most marginal, the poorest um, in society, very poor women. And that the idea of, of having maybe a dream of witchcraft, a fantasy of witchcraft, of having some power, of getting ahead, and then feeling unbelievably guilty about it, and that guilt being prized open by an interrogator, it's just a possibility for a much more complex relationship between the individual and the belief and the interrogator than just the <coughs> idea of, I don't like you, I'm going to accuse you of witchcraft. Thank you. Uh any more questions? You've got one in the front row here, if that's all right. Oh, just on the front row, Dan. Oh, oh, there's more, there's more. <laughs> ah, right. We've got th time for about three quick questions. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Hi. <laughs> I've got a microphone. <laughs> Great. Hi. Sorry. Hi. So I was just thinking about, obviously, we've heard a lot about kind of power and oppression um, and particularly kind of interactions with indigenous communities and obviously kind of following on from this period you've then got empire and you've got colonialism and you have slavery and all these just huge systems of oppression so do you see these ideas kind of flaring up again during that period in the same way or a different way or how does that connect I guess is the question. Yeah. Marion, do you want to that? Yes, yes you do, <laughs> yes you yeah, do. Yeah. So I think that the period of the witch trials contains the seeds of all of those kinds of oppression, you know, particularly when people are starting to identify what they see as racial difference and they see as religious difference. So, of course, yes, that has huge knock-on consequences later on. But once you get into the period of empire, you also find colonial administrators really struggling with the beliefs that they see around them. So there comes a point where they stop thinking that the people all around them are devil worshippers but they're still convinced that there is some magical knowledge that these people have or there are magical practices that these people do, which they profoundly disapprove of. And that can be because, you know, they're Christian missionaries, for example, or it can be because colonial administrators tend to like, you know, order and rationalism and science and what they think of as progress, which, of course, now appears to us to be in many ways the opposite. Um, so those people the people in, in the communities around them, the indigenous people of those countries, they still continue to find them very problematic. So you do find witch trials carrying right on. And sometimes the indigenous people are carrying out their own witch trials, but it seems to me that, that is at least in part because they've been taught to do that by Christian missionaries. And then sometimes you find the colonial authorities are carrying out what turn into, in effect, witch hunts against magical practitioners in the communities because they continue to find them problematic. So, yeah, those ideas do run like this, this thread throughout the history of empire. It gets very confusing. It gets very difficult because people are struggling with that idea. You know, that was a great question you asked. What really happened? Are people really doing magic? Are they really conducting human sacrifices? Are they really carrying out magical rites? Um, and in some cases, yes, they are. And in some cases, no, they aren't. But how can we tell? And the administrators struggle with that and the churchmen struggle with that. Um, but witch trials continue because of that, that continuing question about are these people witches? Or are they something that we think might be like witches? What should we do about it? We've got time for one more question, but obviously conversations can continue after this event. Uh, somebody choose somebody. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, yeah. Um, I was wondering, is there any sort of documentation um, written from sort of a layman's perspective? Because if witches aren't being um, convicted, could this be seen as a failure of the justice system if you think you have witches in your community that aren't being convicted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite briefly, both. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so very quickly. Um, yeah, I think there's, pe people often do feel there's a failure uh, of the justice system at the time, that they, when they're not being taken seriously. And of course, this is particularly true after the repeal of the Witchcraft Act, because even though the Witchcraft Act was repealed in 1735, that the, this is when you find the lynching of witches in English communities. And this goes right up to the First World War, probably even beyond, um, where people are abused and intimidated and often attacked uh, and cut and dragged through water and all this sort of thing. So, and that is when, and this, this, the, the, the case, the, the Trin case in uh, 1751, where um, uh, uh, basically a man was hanged who had led a mob against a, a suspected witch that everybody hated. And he stood on the gallows and he said, I, why am I being hanged for trying to get rid of a witch? And that, that really showed that tension between like what we might think of as a, a popular desire to get rid of witches and what the, war, the, what the law would allow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my book, I talk about a, a case where somebody is murdered because they're thought to be a witch in 1928. Um, in Pennsylvania, a place that you wouldn't think something like that would happen. So, yeah, there does continue to be this tremendous frustration. People go right on believing in magic. I mean, you know, we do, don't we? Who can say, I've never consulted a horoscope, or I've never not walked under a ladder, or I've, I've never, you know, muttered something to myself as a kind of charm to cheer myself one day. Um, so, yeah, people, people continue to believe in magic, and therefore some of them continue to hunt witches as well. We have to draw this event to a close. Um, thank you so much for coming to the session. Oh, thank you.